So I only have like a few slides because the idea here is we're meant to discuss. So for people that haven't been to a BOF before, it stands for Birds of a Feller. It's basically just meant to be a discussion session. So I think we have a couple mics. Um, so the idea is you should stop me at any time and um, ask questions, make comments, and that sort of thing. Uh, that's not it here. Let's do a slideshow. And then um, to start off with, I do have some links in here. So if you go to tinyurl.com elce22-bof, you'll see these slides. So I just spoke about RISC-V, but just for people that weren't there, um, just to kind of level set the conversation. So RISC-V is a free and open ISA. It was started back in 2010 at Berkeley. The V stands for the Roman numeral V because it's the fifth instruction set to come out of Berkeley. And the reason why it's free and open is because the specifications are published under an open source license. So a few things that are different about RISC-V, because it's not the first open ISA, but it's become quite popular. One of the reasons it's a simple, clean slate design. So based on all the experience they had at Berkeley with creating instruction sets, they designed this one, kind of putting aside all the, the past things that they had done. Uh, it's also modular, so the idea here is that they're extensions that allow you to scale from small things like microcontrollers all the way up to supercomputers, potentially. But the key thing here is that it's stable. So we have a base integer ISA, and then we have standard extensions, which are frozen now. Those won't change. And then we add, the way we add new things to RISC-V is through optional extensions. So back at the end of 2021, we had 15 new specifications with 40 extensions. Some of the really interesting things were vector, which is scalable vector instructions hypervisor. Um, so we can do virtual machines and then some things to accelerate cryptography operations and also bit manipulation. So if you want to know more about the instruction set and some of the standard extensions, this book's only about 100 pages and it's available in several languages. It's called the RISC-V Reader. Uh, and then I just quickly wanted to go over RISC-V International. So originally it started at Berkeley. But now the standards, the specifications are developed by RISC-V International, which is at riskv.org. Um, there's a lot of members, including companies and universities. You can, as an individual or a nonprofit organization can join free of cost. Um, I have a link there to a wiki, which has a bunch of resources on it. A lot of the specifications and extensions are developed on mailing lists for the different topic areas. Um, and you can view the public ar archives there um, at that link. And also a lot of these working groups and special interest groups have regular meetings. So there's a meetings calendar that you can check out to see um, when those happen. Now, in terms of hardware, if you want a board to start developing on, RISC-V International has something called the Developer Boards Program. So the idea here is they want to get boards out to open source developers. Um, so there is a form you can fill out on the riskv.org website. Um, and I will bring up those links again at, for the slides, because if you want to pull up the links, you can do that. I also put the PDF on the SCED page. Um, so I just spoke like half an hour ago about Linux, Risk, Linux on RISC-V. So if you're interested in that, you can click on that and look at the slides or my talk, which should also be on the conference platform. Uh, there was a microconference conference RISC-V at Plumbers back on Tuesday, and the live stream of that is online. And then there was also several uh, kind of interesting talks that kind of go over some of the different ecosystem things that happened uh, earlier this year. And I host something called Open Hours every two weeks. Is this meant to be kind of an informal virtual meetup where we talk about like RISC-V software and RISC-V dev boards? Um, so the next one will be on October 12th. That one will be not good for Europe. That'll be for the uh, Asia time zone, but then on the 26th, that'll be early evening in Europe. So RISC-V itself is not an open source processor. It's just a set of open source. It's just a set of specifications under an open source license. So if it says it's RISC-V, it could be open source or it could be proprietary. Depends on the implementation. But for me, the thing I'm excited about is that open specifications make open source implementations possible. So an open ISA makes it possible to have an open source processor design. And there are actually several open source cores that are available. So we have uh, Rocket and Boom from Berkeley and Pulp from ETH Zurich, which is a whole family of cores. Western Digital created something called Swerve. 
which they were using for like storage controllers. And those are open source as well. And then the Open Hardware Group has been trying to create um, verified IP that you could drop into your, uh, like companies could drop into their own ASIC designs called the Core 5. And then I don't know if they're here, but there's actually someone here from Low Risk, and they've been involved in the Open Titan project, which is a silicon root of trust project um, and that's using an open source core as well. Has anyone used any of these cores? Or Cool. Does anyone have any comments or anything they want to say about it? Oh, can we have a microphone over here? Thank you. I was going to say um, both uh, Vectrix 5 and Pico RB32 RB have all been taped out. So oh, nice. putting them under FPGA software. Ah, OK. Service. Yes, that's a good point. <laughs> Yeah, I should say FPGA friendly. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that is a good point that they are both in. Um, actually, I'm going to, I think the next slide is about the open source silicon stuff that's going on. Cool. Oh, yeah. So the one I didn't include on there because I had a separate slide for it was Alibaba mm -hmm. has a chip design company called T Head. So kind of similar to Sci Fi, but it's part of, uh, you know, kind of like Sci Fi where they design cores and license them. But the neat thing is they released four of their RISC-5 cores is open source, and one of them is actually in a SOC from all winter called the D1. So if you want to look at their RTL, you can actually go to their GitHub and pull that up. Yeah? Sorry, is there an SOC also in D1, or is it just the core? Uh, well, the, the question was um, if the SOC was open source. Um, so in this situation, Alibaba T had designed the core, so that's the only thing that they open sourced. And then the SOC is by All Winner, and I don't think All Winner releases any of that. So, um, unfortunately, usually like a lot of the IP is licensed from other companies, so yeah. it's usually not. I was yeah? also going to say, be wary because it's all generated RTL. Okay. It's it's, it's generated Verilog, and I don't think uh, there's been discussions, but I don't think yet that they've put the 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 source and the tool out. Okay, so like your ability to use this to tape out your own core, probably no, not probably not too useful, yeah, not, right? Yeah, not not great yet for yeah. a collaborative project. Yeah, unfortunately, but uh, they they are they are aware of the issue. Okay, the reason I thought this was kind of neat because you can get a board with all winner D one, and then you can look at the RTL for the core, and it might not match up like exactly right, like what they taped out might be slightly different. But I, I saw some people looking at like the MMU. Uh, RTL, like the Verilog or whatever it is for the um, MMU, and they were working on the Linux code. And I thought that was kind of neat because I don't know of too many situations where you're working on the driver and you can go look at the RTL for, for that part of the core. Yeah, that's going to be the game changer, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, probably many of us have done that, but it was like we were working for the company, right? So in this case, it's the public that's able to do that. Um, there's a high-performance core um, that's being worked on at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um, they're trying to tape that out as well. So I, there'll probably be an update at the RISC-V Summit, which is in December, about this project. But that was another one I've been looking at. Um, but yeah, not, not like a commercially available thing yet. OK. Yes. So this was like the one that uh, hopefully we can talk a lot about, because there's a lot of interesting things happening here. So. One of the organizations that I follow a lot is called FASI, um, which is the Free and Open Source Silicon Foundation. They have a monthly newsletter, um, which I like. To, I always like to check out because it has all the latest things that are going on with like open source FPGA tool chains and open source silicon projects. Um, and then I think probably the most important thing that's happened in the last couple of years with, with like open hardware is that Google has teamed up with eFabless um, to create this uh, open source, well, they're working with this uh, former Cypress fab in Minnesota called Skywater. And they've been able to open source their 130 nanometer process design kit, so the, or PDK. So this is the, these are the files that say like the, how the transistor cells are designed and all the um, design rule checks and all these sorts of things. All the, all the proprietary information that you need to actually provide, to like produce the math that's gonna be used for lithography at the fab. Um, so this is like the lowest level of information that you need. So this is now open source for their 130 nanometer process. And they just announced, like I think last month, the 90, that they're going to do that for 90 nanometers as well. 
So no, this is not like the latest, greatest stuff, but it's actually quite useful for microcontroller class devices. Um, and yeah. Okay, yeah. So the, the comment was I, that the Pentium 4 was kind of this era. So I mean, there was a lot of things that I did on my Pentium 4. So, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not, you know, it's not like what we have nowadays, but there's a lot of interesting things that you can do with it, right? Um, and the, to the, the other really important thing here is that they have a free of cost multi-project wafer. So they combine a bunch of different designs onto a wafer and they're doing that for free. The only requirement is that it's open source. So I think once a quarter they do one of these multi-project wafers. So I think it's 40 projects per wafer. So you just, you do your project and you submit a pull request and you know, they've, there's actually not that many people doing it. So if you are interested and you learn the tools, you actually have a pretty good chance of getting your chips made. And the other big thing here was like not that many people probably know how to do this. So there's this interesting course called Zero to ASICs run by a pers person named Matthew Van that takes you through how to use all these different open source tools that you would need people to design your own chip. Kind of the use case here is, you know, for people that are maybe not already chip design engineers, maybe you're a software engineer and you're like, it'd be super cool to make your own chip. Yeah, go ahead. Add, he's also just done the tiny tape out project. Okay. Uh, which gives you, I mean, you can, like, you can do a tiny like 300, 400 gate design. Um, and he's putting, I can't remember, loads of designs on one. Yeah, okay. On one so if you don't need. It's a really nice yeah. lightweight. And there's a nice kind of GitHub interface there. So you can, uh, you know, you can do a design using um, kind of a, a, a graphical uh, logic tool, but you can also put in your own. Verilog and that cool. Sort of thing. So that's so called tiny tape out. Tiny tape out okay. dot com. Dot com. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing to mention is, of course, that there's also the global foundries have now got in the game. So there's now the 180 through global foundries, which is particularly exciting because the round trip time is going to be a lot shorter than Skywater. Uh, so um, we did a tape out on Skywater. And the MPW5, we're still waiting for it a year later. <laughs> um, oh, so you you were uh, you did one of the projects then? Okay. Yeah, we cool. didn't. Uh, so so I'm chipflow.io. Oh, cool. And uh, yes, yeah, so we did our test. We test our tool chain, doing an MP, uh, a kind of a microcontroller class on MPW5 and a Linux capable SOC on MPW6. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. I mean, like, only just about capable, but yeah. Yeah, no, had, I, I'm very interested in... We Linux booting in, in, in simulation, okay. right? So cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, what core was did you use on it? So we used Extras 5. Okay. And then the SOC was built with Amaranth. Oh, cool. And that, the, so Amaranth's... Um, do you want to, by the way, since you're from Chipflow, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? And, and yeah, the, the if, tools if people and, are interested. Yeah. yeah, so basically what we're trying to do is with Chipflow, um, I think it's like I think the term we're, that we're, we're coming to is fabulous semiconductor as a service. So the idea is is like we have you. So we're using Amaranth as the front end. So you've got a nice Python environment, good debugging, good simulation speed that you can use to do your design and do. And we got structures coming in for how you do your verification for that to get your coverage. And then you can do a test on the platform. Then you can do a test tape test chip tape out. Uh, and we'll be supporting proprietary processes as well as the open processes um, and uh, and then be able to go to manufacturing, full manufacturing with manufacturing test at nice. the end of it. So I'm very excited. I, I m The previous talk was just about Linux on RISC-5 and like my ideal thing would be able to run Linux on one of these open source chips. Yeah. Um, so I, I saw that they replaced the Pico RV32 on the MPW yeah, with, with the RISC-5. Yeah. And I've used Vex RISC-5 on FPGAs to run Linux, so that's that's quite exciting. Yeah, Vex RISC-5 is quite capable, really. It's probably the same sort of capability as a, um, you know, an R1 or something from ARM. Um, it's, it's got pretty good throughput for the size and gate. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff. There's so many things happening. So there's now an open power design being built in Amaranth as well, which is going to be fun. Um, 
Yeah. Did you want to, um, so I didn't really get, really get into all the uh, Python and all those yeah. sorts of things. Did you want to uh, mention that? Yeah, or? I can give a little bit of, a, bit, bit of history. So yeah. there's like there's now been about 10 years worth of work of how to do hardware design in Python. Um, so it starts off with the MyGen project about a decade ago. Um, and then probably about five years ago now, I think, um, that was forked off into nMyGen which is kind of not quite compatible. There's different, you can, you can use my gen code, but you'll get different RTL output at the end of it. Um, but that gave a lot more power and capability. And then recently there was a bit of a trademark fight. So nMyGen became renamed Amaranth. Um, and, uh, and that's where, we're, so at Chipflow, we're gonna be heavily sponsoring Amaranth and bringing it on so it can be a, a full toolkit for, for both FPGA and, uh, and and silicon. Great. Uh, and like we're, we're also doing a project, and uh, you know, this will be marketing around this at some point. But we're also working with uh, a company called Pragmatic, who do plastic ICs, and we'll yeah. do a very cheap turnaround plastic versions Pla of your plastic. Was so it like a polymer? Like so, it's yeah, flexible it's or yeah, it's about it's about a 0 0.7 micron process. So. Like not you're not gonna do anything mind bending and break you know do the world, but it's a great way to actually make some things and interesting see it work and do it cheaply. What are the applications for that? Oh gosh, well they're they're the market areas that the I mean if you look at what they're talking about publicly at the moment, a lot of it's on the packaging, like smart RFID, you know, being uh. able to do things like op optimize what the you know the best before date on a package. You know, a, a little bit of a um, any ink display there, and you can measure, like, did this was this package within the right tolerances of humidity and temperature okay. for all of its supply chain? Okay, then we can do the we can have a longer shelf life for that. Oh um, wow, that's that's one of the areas. I think healthcare is also going to be an interesting area as well for that. Yeah, but yeah, really interesting stuff. Wow, and it, so I didn't have it on here, but you also mentioned with the Google multi-project wafer that. No, well, yeah. there's now one Global yeah. Foundries involved, right? Yeah, so Go Google's now got a deal with Global Foundries. Okay. So they've op they're o they have opened the 180 PDK for Global Foundries. I was um, pretty excited that Global yeah. Foundries is involved because, yeah. I mean, I never heard of Skywater before. They're apparently an old Cypress fab, but like Global Foundries, like they do IBM stuff, right? Yeah, they're, they're big. So that's, that's they, pretty they cool. IBM. They wear IBM, like it's the old, okay. I it's old AMD fab and the old I IBM fab. So right, right. Took it together and 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 uh, uh, financially engineered off, and uh, yeah, uh, so you know that's that's going to be a big one. And Global Foundries is kind of unique amongst the uh, the fabs, um, the foundry services companies because they're really focusing on older technologies, uh, and that's where we'll get the open source first, right? It's on the older technologies. So it's going to yeah. be a while before we can seriously tape out fintech designs sure, yeah. in, in open source. But I think, you know, w I mean, we're aiming to try and get 65 nanometers nice. going at some point in There's a lot, the yeah, scale I don't want to commit to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the, um, I didn't list all the people involved in here, but one of the people at Google that's been behind a lot of the hardware tool chain stuff, his name's Tim, An Tim, Tim Ansel. Ansel yeah. And uh, he knows I, I want to run Linux on a, like a Libre silicon chip. And he always told me like, you know, if I want that to happen, I need to promote this. So yep. if we get people using 130, then get them using 90, and then Google sees Google sees that it's like a useful thing, then it'll it'll they'll hopefully be able to like convince fabs to do more processes. Absolutely, right? so I, th I think I think I love this space because like I mean I'm an old hand open source guy, right? You know I was building stuff commercially late 90s. My first business, o open source, was Collabora in 2005. Okay. So I love this because it feels like the old days for me. Yeah. Right. You know, it's like that you can you can know everyone in the community, and there's a few heroes like really pulling everything along, like your Alan Coxes and your Linuses of the old. Um, so yeah, no, I love this space. It's so much fun. I think it's gonna be a, I think it's gonna be a massive green game changer awesome. for how we do this, like and how we do embedded systems and and everything in the future. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Like the number of times when, if any of us are on the device driver side, like we all know the pain of when hardware design doesn't understand software, uh, and this gives us a chance to solve that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like what? Like um, 
one of the things I thought was quite interesting, in, like in the FPGA world, like I've run Linux on system on chips that are in FPGAs that are using open source projects like like Lidex. And like in this instance, you control both the hardware peripheral and Linux. So it's like one of these things, they, there was uh, conversations about upstreaming some of these drivers. And it was kind of interesting. It's like, do we change the peripheral to better fit what's already in Absolutely. Linux? Absolutely, yeah. So it was, a, it was an unusual conversation because normally, normally that's not something you get to decide, right? So that's yeah, yeah. quite interesting. Uh, did anyone else participate in the MPW? Or I know, I, I've not had time myself, but um, yeah, there's like a good number of projects that have been taped out on this process. Um, yeah? Which processes are available on the Google um, um, MPW or in what you mentioned before? The you mean like the you know? technology yes. node? So in this case, it's 130 nanometer, and then they just announced 90 nanometer, and then you were saying they also announced 180 with Global Foundry. Yeah, which is... Uh, right, right. Um, so yeah, I, I'm excited about the Global Foundry thing because that's... They probably have a lot of technology they could potentially get involved, right? Um, did you want to say anything about low risk? I, I mentioned low risk earlier, and um, they were one of like kind of the first organizations uh, a few years ago to start talking about doing open source chips. Yeah, so uh, I mean, I just started a few months ago, but uh, yeah, our, our main focus at the moment is Open Titan, which will hopefully get us uh, kind of open source SOC going. Um, in this case for security purposes and and in security it's a really cool area for the openness right like yeah uh, in cryptography we've known for a long time that you kind of don't want security through obscurity yeah so uh, having an open source root of trust is just a really cool thing yeah and that's what we're trying to get get going yeah and um, I didn't really go over the relationship here but the um, ibex core is interesting because it originally started at ETH Zurich so ETH, I mean, Berkeley has been really involved with RISC-V, but another group that has is ETH Zurich has the pulp team there, and they created a family of cores. I think originally it was called uh, Pulpy, or I, do, you know, do you know which one became IBEX? I think it was Pulpino. Pulpino, okay. So but, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the nice thing about having taken that from ETH Zurich and putting it into low risk is that now we can provide the support and making sure that it's actually tape outable and stuff. And IBEX has been used in many different, not just OpenTide, many different projects for tape outs and stuff like that. Yeah. Nice. One of the things I remember from like the low risk blog was talking about how to do like kind of things like continuous integration and making things testable and, and verification and those sorts of things. So it looked like you were really kind of polishing like the initial design that came from ETH Zurich. Yeah, and, and the main challenge in Open Titan at the moment is just doing the whole digital ver verification, design verification type stuff. Right. Um, so yeah, I think I think low risk actually can do like hopefully what we can do is also uh, provide some knowledge transfer about how we've done that DV and uh, and make sure that it's transferable to other open SOC right, right. Um, projects. Does anyone have any questions, comments? We don't have the speakers you can throw. You know, we don't have the throw microphones, but uh, we can hand them back. I do. Um, yeah. Could you give some kind of overview about the kind of rollout expected for Risk Five? You know, kind of commercially. And how it's going to go from maybe microcontrollers to application processors to whatever. I mean, what what, what do you see the future, say five yeah. years hence for for Risk Five in in the field? I think right now for for Risk Five, it's most applicable to kind of embedded systems. So I think the the advantage, one of the advantages of Risk Five is because it's an open architecture, companies that already have their own design teams can implement their own architecture any way they want. Like the way that you implement the ISA is completely up to you. Um, so that gives a lot of advantage to be able to like design things that are like really optimized for your use case. Um, so there's, I've seen companies doing things with like very low power designs, like things like energy harvesting and doing like novel things in terms of design um, of like the things around it. So so really like the, the, the circuitry that's doing like, that's like executing the instructions may not be the most interesting part of like a RISC-V chip, right? So the, the, 
this whole thing started with a group at Berkeley that was doing design, uh, doing research into accelerators. So what they were really interested in was like in accelerators, like vector accelerators, and they just needed like an ISA to start working on. And they looked at some other options, and they decided it would be simplest or best in their for their case just to, to come up with their own base ISA. So the idea here is like risk five is kind of simple. It's not very fancy, and the whole idea here is it's, it's a great base to build things on top of. So like whatever your area of specialization is, you can build on top of that. So I've seen some interesting things at the low end, like with energy harvesting, um, wearables, and, and some things like that. Um, yeah, so if someone's making like an application, like making a ASIC that's very optimized for like a particular use case, like having the RISC-V core in there for like the general computation makes a lot of sense. And then it's probably integrating with some other things on the die that do some more specialized uh, um, acceleration or something like that. Um, and in terms of the higher end, there are three, about three companies that are startups in the RISC-V space that are targeting the data center. So I think there's already a fair amount of stuff for the low end of RISC-V, but in terms of like higher performance, um, there's Ventana, Esperanto, and Revos that are kind of doing higher performance systems. There's not a whole lot of information about what they're doing yet, but the idea is like that they're trying to make like really high performance devices, probably focused on accelerators for like the data center space. So I'm quite interested to see what will happen there for like the high end. Um, the other thing that's quite interesting is Intel has gotten involved with RISC-V, uh, specifically Intel Foundry services. So Intel now offers their fabs as like you can go there and get your chip made. Um, so for them, with their Foundry services, I think they want things to show off. Um, and, you know, probably doing ARM SOCs is maybe not the best idea for that. So I think RISC-V was really attractive for them for that. So they've teamed up with one of the RISC-V IP providers, one of the companies that does cores named Sci-5. And they're doing an SOC on one of Intel's like advanced processes, I think seven nanometer. Um, and that's called Horse Creek, um, or at least that's the code name. So I'll be really interested to see what comes out of Horse Creek. Because right now we don't really have any high performance RISC-V hardware available commercially. Like there are like academic research groups and stuff that do higher performance stuff. But um, I'm really excited to see what will happen there. The other thing that I think is possible is for like mid-range devices or like smart IoT devices. And that's what Alwiner, I think, is targeting with their chip. Um, and I think there will be other licensees of Alibaba T-Head that will come out with like kind of mid-range processors. Um, one of the things I didn't mention is that Alibaba T-Head ported Android to um, their system. So I would expect to see like licensees like Alwiner come out with RISC-V based SOCs meant to run like low-end Android devices. Um, part of there is probably like to save on costs. You know, they don't have to deal with licensing um, for the ISA, right? They probably, most of these companies are still going to license a core, a company like he had, but um, I think that'll happen at the mid-range. Yeah? Uh, I guess Linus has made kind of a point recently around the ARM side of things and, you know, releasing Linux from an M1 Mac, yeah. um, you know, and kind of dog-fooding that. Um, like, there's ARM's been around for decades, but it, there really is with the Ashai Linux project, there's kind of a momentum now that there's ARM available in a you know, consumer, you know, performance desktop, laptop package. Yeah. Will it take that with Risk V? Do you think that would, and what's kind of the timeline there, you know, like to break it out, that embedded niche, you know? To yeah. I guess this is for Linux desktop perspective and the yeah. people are interested in the Libre stuff. I think Libre Linux people are We really need that. Like the, yeah. the thing that's kind of gating, um, so in terms of having like, being able to like, compile Linux and release it on a RISC-V system. The thing is like, we don't really have any good SOCs for doing that yet. Like the all winner one is like one gigahertz single core. There's a couple companies that are making multi-core ones, but they've not gone into full production yet, but I think they will. So there's a couple like, maybe like one, f like four core 1.5 gigahertz systems. Um, and, but none of those are in full mass production yet. But I think going into next year, hopefully next year we'll start to see kind of like uh, mid-range single board computers like you know a couple core like the they're not going to be very high performance but like they you could start running like a basic Linux desktop on it that sort of thing um, in fact the the Alibaba um, the T had they have a design called the C910 which is a higher performance one is a it's an out-of-order core 
they say equivalent to maybe like an A76. Um, and I think when we see companies making like SOCs or some, something like that. Um, so right now, everything's either like kind of uh, test runs or like low quantity like eval runs. Um, so hopefully next year we'll start to see like full mass production for some of these things. Um, the other thing I think that would be interesting is what happens with the Intel Horse Creek. So they announced this is a RISC-V SOC with a Sci-5 core um, that's going to be in like their seven minutes, I think seven nanometer process. So it really comes down to like whether or not they made affordable dev boards, which like my hope is that they come up with some dev boards and they maybe subsidize them because it's like trying to promote their foundry services. So that would be really good for the open source software developers to have like a much higher performance board. Yeah, yeah. Also at the Linux Plumbers conference in the RISC-V track, one of these presenters had this uh, RISC-V laptop with him, with a broken keyboard. He did? Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize he, that. I, I don't know okay. who, who, what's his name was, but like, he yeah. had this RISC-V based laptop with him. Yeah. Well, I didn't, I didn't put it in there, but there, has a, there is a company called Exobyte that has announced a RISC-V based laptop. Um, But there is, there is one that's been announced. They've just announced that it's going to happen. They haven't really said when or how much. But um, uh, I think, I would guess that it's probably going to have like that Alibaba C910, which they claim is like an A76 performance. But like, I don't, they didn't say how they claim that. So I don't know. I could say, it seems like maybe by this time next year, we'll have like a mid-range RISC-V laptop. Um, It'll probably be painful to use by like our normal standards, but I think it's something that you could start doing, like actually maybe use, like kind of, I'm thinking like ARM netbook 10 years ago, you know, maybe that sort of thing. Um, yeah. I was going to say, um, it's worth talking to Ben Dukes as well if you're doing that, because uh, uh, Code Think have a GNOME build. They like the whole GNOME build system now does uh, RISC five as well as. Yeah, uh, we've had a few breakages on that. Oh. Demo. <laughs> <laughs> he said, he just said, we've had a few breakages. We tried to demo it and it failed. So <laughs> your mileage may vary. Yeah. Oh, uh, in, in terms of the, uh, um, so one of the reasons why none of the RISC five Linux distros are official right now is they don't really have hardware to build them on other than cross compiling. So. Like Fedora, Debian, Ubuntu, like all have support, but it's not official yet. Um, Fedora tells me they won't make it official and then until they have hardware that they can do native compiling on because that's one of the rules for Fedora. So I think we really need one of these startups like uh, Ventana or Revos to hopefully come up with like really high performance hardware that people could buy, put in a rack, you know. And for that, maybe one or two years, I'm hoping. Yeah, go ahead. So yeah, no, um, just going to Rob's comment, uh, we are building free desktop SDK and Nomos. Um, we have definitely had build it, builds working. It's just that, of course, as soon as we want to bring our unmatched board over here, of course, the build stops and it doesn't work. <laughs> and it's like, who, where did we leave the last working? Because yes, the big problem for us for doing this sort of thing is the availability of hardware yeah. and the unmatched boards are just not fast enough. And um, whoever designed them needs to learn how to make non-noisy fans because, um, but yeah. So, so <laughs> for people that aren't familiar, one of, the, one of the boards people have been using a lot is the Sci-5 Unmatched, which they've unfortunately discontinued. So, yeah, we kind of will be waiting to see what they come out with next. So, yeah. uh, cross-compiling guy here, the Yokto guy. So we don't have the hardware to build on problem, but we have a uh, problem that, uh, well, we need somebody to resource us to do cross builds on our build cluster. And the build cluster is currently fully booked with legacy architectures, you know, x86, ARM, MIPS and PowerPC, all of them legacy. Um, so to add another one, uh, we simply need somebody like Sci5 to get us more server hardware that is ARM or x86, doesn't matter, it will cross compile, it will run the test matrix in QMU and then there will be official Yocto RISC-V, not until then. So, so a different yeah. problem, but... 
So if anyone works for a company that cares that cares about RISC-V and would like to see support in Yocto, you need to su supply some data center cap uh, capacity, well, right? Uh, no, well, the right thing to do would be to join the yes. project as yes. a member company and come to the member company meeting and say, we want this and uh, we're willing to resource this and let's get this done. Yeah, uh, That's how it usually works. Like we have ARM as a member, Intel as a member, but not any of the risk five. Until then, it's a community effort which may or may not work. Yeah. Intel is kind of interesting though because they are heavily involved in risk five now from the aspect of their foundry services um, business. So maybe, maybe. Uh well, maybe I could ask Thomas, I mean, Thomas Gleisner to ask Intel about this. Uh yeah. Well, so. Um, uh, there will be the RISC-V Summit in December, so I will, I will keep this in my mind when I'm talking to people there, because it'll be all the vendors there, right? So mm -hmm. need to, I'll keep on harassing them about That's joining the Yocto project. Yeah, yeah, that <laughs> would be nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, yeah, Justin, oh. the mic. Yeah. I mean, definitely having an unmatched board, you should probably be talking to Sci-5 a lot, because their default distribution for that yeah. board that they ship with it is a Yocto image. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, you know, I, yeah. Um, when I was looking for a job, I actually sent my CV to them just in case they would be interested in a Yocto guy and there was never any reaction back yeah. from them. <laughs> 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 okay. But I, I agree with you. So vendors that are using Yocto for their SDK should join the Yocto project and provide resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and don't just expect <laughs> community to do things for you. I think everyone in this room is, is <laughs> with that sentiment, <laughs> yeah. We just need to find people with the yeah, budget. There is meta risk five layer, but it's, I think, a heroic effort by yeah. Cam, Cam So, uh, yes, yeah. So he was mentioning that there's the meta risk five layer. So actually all the risk five so stuff we're talking about, all the risk five boards, I think all of them are supported with, unofficially with Yocto, with meta dash risk five, but it's kind of the heroic efforts, as you said, of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, Raj and maybe a couple you other know, people. You know him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell Cam it's awesome. I think he has yeah. an army of little camps doing all the work. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. don't know when he sleeps, but <laughs> he's a volunteer thing. Mm. Maybe it's worth giving him a card at some point or trying to talk about this further. Nice. Of, of your card? You were uh, saying contact, uh, yeah, just it would be good to exchange contact, contact information. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, That's what he talked before. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Making um, connections. Well, I'm, I'm Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> cool. The Alex of Yorkto, so. I think we only have a few minutes left. Anyone have any last questions, comments? Oh, yeah. If uh, if someone starts building one of these open chips, yeah, what happens with all the peripherals and, and components on top? Uh, yeah, is there a this is a really good question, right? So like, yeah, we we're talking about cores, but you need a lot more than a core to do it, right? So there are groups as part of this Google effort, like um, to do things, but we're very at very simple beginnings, right? So like, there's a group at UC Santa Barbara that's doing open RAM as an open SRAM because we don't actually have a way with open source designs to create SRAM. So they, they're now able to create, I think, a couple of kilobytes of SRAM in that Pi 5 that Michael Welling's been doing and a couple other people, like they're using that open RAM from UC Santa Barbara to, to, to make their RAM. But yeah, we're talking about like just having SRAM, right? So uh, yeah, it's early days. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, we're going to be, um, there is there's start, there's a few things starting to come together in the Amaranth world for, um, peripherals, um, there's a bit of basis. One of the things we're, we're doing first is um, being able to abstract which buses the peripherals. So we can abstract buses, we can go, I want this to be wishbone or it's sign, we'll automatically generate all that stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a few peripherals there at the moment. Um, there's some there's some USB stuff like that you could do a, a pretty simple, like uh, you know, USB device with um, dry, you know, 
uh, video driver wise there's some there's bits and pieces there's l i mean there's a, there's there's really yeah you know, it's like simple frame buffer stuff or driving hdmi all these sort of things but in terms of like like a capable sock level better level ip i think there's a few few things still to get done right yeah you know and we we, we hack together which you know i've said that these these are the projects i really want to get yeah. I really will promote people into, right? Yeah. Um, so it looks you know, like we've got like a basic yeah. hyper round control, basic SPI, QSPI yeah. controllers, um, and uh, and you know there will be a you know a, a section under the Amaranth project to build up these capabilities in Amaranth. But there's also a few things that are going on. But the problem is, there isn't really one place yet to go for all this stuff. No, no. And but I think that's a really interesting yeah. next stage. And Which is actually... Know, I'll talking with uh, Stefano. Yeah, I'll, I'll sell this. the... With the <laughs> final moment here, I'll sell the Fosse Foundation. Absolutely. If anyone's trying to collect all these efforts together, it's the Fosse Foundation. Yeah. So um, please check out their website. But yeah, we got to basically build everything from, from <laughs> scratch. Um, so it's, it's interesting times. It's a great time to get involved with uh, open source uh, silicon open source chip yeah this, this is like being involved in linux version 1.0 yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> in all the good ways and bad ways that yeah. is <laughs> all right thank you everyone